If you want to eat healthy and Praise the Lord. Well, it's good to see everybody here this morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I hope y'all are having a good time. Wonderful Sunday school lesson this morning. I asked the, uh, I had the uh, adult Sunday school book, and we were in the youth uh, class, and I asked them if that was all right, if, if they could use the adult Sunday school lesson for today. And Carter was a little hesitant, but he agreed that it was okay that we use the adult one this morning. But it is good to see everybody. We're going to do things a little different this morning. I wanted to 
kick things off with announcements before we get started. And so um, just want to remind everybody the offering plates are up here. It's May, May the 1st. And so May means new offerings. And uh, offerings this month are going to Mother's Memorial. Um, there was a video posted last night about Mother's Memorial on our Facebook page, so go check that out. There's, a, there's so many awesome, awesome things that Mother's Memorial um, benefits and goes to and stuff, so um, that'll be what we're giving to this month. Family prayer Monday night. So tomorrow night, uh, family prayer here at the church. Um, had a wonderful, wonderful time uh, last month in family prayer. We had a great turnout. Um, and so I really want to encourage everybody to come and be a part of family prayer. It was really fantastic. Um, next Sunday morning, like Resurrection Sunday, one of the times that you can get people to come to the house of the Lord. So Mother's Day, next Sunday morning, bring, bring somebody. <laughs> any, any, any siblings, you know, any folk, you know, just... Get everybody here, support Mama, and be here during that service. We're going to have a tremendous, tremendous time in the Lord, have an opportunity to honor all of our mothers. Um, National Day of Prayer is this Thursday, and so uh, on the church Facebook page, there's a, there's a slide up here. You can save that on your phone. So on the church Facebook page, there's a <clears throat> graphic that kind of gives you an idea of what we're wanting to do. So um, Thursday, May the 5th. We're going to do a daytime fast, so sunrise to sunset, we're calling for a fast. So if you can fast everything, fast everything. If you can't, fast something, and then be in prayer all day. And I understand, recognize that everybody maybe can't stop down during the day and pray, but if you can, do, and then save this. And so you'll, you'll know that at every increment of the day what folks in your church are praying for. And so we're going to pray. We're going to pray together in unity. We're going to pray for our country. We're going to pray for our church and pray for our community and pray for our church leaders, pray for our government Jesus. leaders. And we're just going to come together and pray and be a part of... I, I'm glad that we have a nation that has a National Day of Prayer. Amen. Amen. And so we want, to, we want to see our country blessed. We want to see our community blessed. We want to see our church blessed. So be a part of that and pray. Uh, small groups are going on. We just finished our first full month. It was fantastic, folks. Just just great time of fellowship with so many, many people. Uh, it means uh, so much to my family, um, you know, having come back. And um, we need fellowship. Amen. Amen. We need to, we need to see people and be involved with people and get to um, be around folks. And it was a blessing to us. I know it's been a blessing to those folks who have been involved. So sign up for small groups if you haven't already and be sure to attend um, those events. And then a uh, ladies rally, May the 13th, Sister Bobby Wendell. It is right around the corner. So the Friday following Mother's Day, uh, we'll be in service here, all the ladies. And then, of course, uh, Vacation Bible School. We get closer and closer each Sunday. But June 30th through July 2nd, we'll have registration uh, here pretty soon and uh, have a wonderful vacation Bible study. But won't you stand this morning? Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise as we begin to worship him this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. You're great and mighty, Lord. Thank you. Amen. Amen.
sick right now and then we're going to do our confession now. Lord, we thank you, Lord God. Coming before you, knowing, Lord, that your word <clears throat> is, is real. Knowing by your stripes we are healed. We bind the devil on every side. We plead the blood of Jesus. Asking the Lord in the sickness in the body, praying right now from the top of their head to the sole of their feet. We call them heal, heal now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for believe and receive.
our faith hygiene. Praise God. You got physical hygiene, it's our faith hygiene. Keep it going. Keep your focus. Amen. Amen. Repeat after me. Say, my body is the temple of the Lord. My body is the temple of the Lord. Strong and healthy. Strong and healthy. Every sickness. Every sickness. Every disease. Every disease. Every virus. Every virus. Every plague. Every plague. Every, plague. every germ. Every germ. Every allergy. Every allergy. That comes near my body. That comes near my body. My family. My family. My church family. My church family. Or my dwelling. Or my dwelling. Dies instantly. Dies instantly. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I am covered. By the blood of Jesus. By the blood of Jesus. I believe. I believe. And receive. And receive. All this. All this in Jesus' name. In Jesus. Give him a hand, praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. 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 Keep on standing. Which way we sing another song in Jesus' Amen. name. Amen. God bless you. <clears throat>
the Lord and thank you for this service. Father, Hallelujah. I thank you, Lord. I magnify you. We worship you, Amen. Lord. Amen. Glory. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 You may be seated. I want to mention a few things to you. So glad to see you in the house of the Lord. I want to mention, I appreciate Brother Ray he came yesterday and he emptied the baptistry and cleaned the baptistry and refilled the baptistry and turned the heater on. Thank you. And we're going to be baptizing soon. One of Brother Clavel's sisters in oh, Jesus' name should be baptized soon. And, um, so I went ahead and hope and anticipation heated it up. So anybody else wants to get baptized today, the water is warm. Anyway, um. So it's ready. Whenever she's ready, brother, it'll be ready for her. So we're excited about that. Um, and that's coming up. And so, again, appreciate Brother Ray. He's done this for many years and make sure that baptistry is taken care of and he's, he's cleaned. I'm going to miss him when he's gone for a whole bunch of reasons. But one of you guys got to get a burden and, and get training from him on what to do <laughs> with that baptistry <laughs> since they're going to be leaving us not uh, before too long. Of course, we're going to see them. They'll still come around, some small groups and things like that. And, and be in, in fellowship with us. His, the, their sister Nancy's son-in-law, uh, their son-in-law is uh, going to be the new pastor at Apostolic Faith Tabernacle uh, starting in June. So the Ambrose will be with us here through the month of May. And then they're going to go over there where the grandkids are. That's probably the real reason. It's not really the son-in-law. <laughs> Daughter might have something to do with it, but I just have a feeling, Sister Rogers, it's really about the grandkids. That's what it's all about. So I always, I've said this before, I'll say it again. I'll probably say it plenty of times. I, I always wish that Sister Frances Simmons could have lived to see this day. <laughs> Sister Frances Simmons is a lady in our church. My wife used to say things like, I'm not going to babysit my grandkids. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. And Sister Simmons would say, oh, sister, you just wait. You just wait. You just wait. Anyway, she would have rejoiced. In this day, if she could have lived to see it, and um, all of her prophecies, they weren't really prophecies, they're predictions, you know, prophecies when God says some predictions, when you just know it, because you got a lot of life experience. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we're going to miss the Ambroses, but we're happy for them that the children are coming near. We appreciate, understand that concern. I've had children more than 1,000 miles away, more than 5,000 miles away, so <laughs> we... Um, we uh, certainly understand that. So appreciate tremendously all of you. We, had a, we finished the month of April and all of our small group situation the first month was a great success. Appreciate Brother Adam Crystal, all they've done. 
and spearheading all that and directing it and organizing it. And so this is the month of Mother's Day is next week, and a lot of the small groups kind of backload a little bit toward the end of the month. Uh, but we're trying to dodge Mother's Day and Father's Day next month and all those things. So some months they'll be spread out better and some months maybe not so greatly. But um, Mother's Day is next week and it is a great day. And I told Sandra Harris this last week, a few weeks ago, I, was, I, was, I don't know when it was, I was working on a sermon, I guess last week sometime, week and a half ago. And, and, um, and I thought, well, this sermon title would be good for this sermon, What the Mama Knew. And then it dawned on me, I'm, I'm a few weeks away from Mother's Day. I need, to, I need to postpone that sermon. So I just put that, you know, I was already ready to go. I'm going to save that for Mother's Day. And I started working on some other stuff. And, and I was working on a sermon. And all of a sudden, I got that sermon last week. And I thought, I'll just call this what the scribe knew. So I was thinking, well, if I could get something in between there, that's a what the something, you know, knew, some, what somebody knew, I would do it. But I wasn't going to force the issue, you know. And then this week I was studying and had a question asked me. And, and so this morning, I'm going to preach to you on what the donkey knew. Now, these sermons are all unrelated. They don't have anything to do with each other. And I said to my wife, I said, this might be a little, I might have a little. She said, nah, three is enough. So anyway, um, next week, I'm going to preach on you what the mama knew. But today, I'm going to minister to you on the subject of what the donkey knew. And I, I'll take you to Matthew chapter 21, verse number 1. Matthew 21, verse number 1. <clears throat> when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethphage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find a donkey tied and a colt with her, loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Sion, Behold, the king cometh unto thee meek, and sitting upon a donkey, a colt, and a colt, the foal of a donkey. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the donkey and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way, and the multitudes that went before and that followed, cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Father, we thank you for your many blessings, for your grace and your mercy. We magnify you. We glorify you. Thank you for your word. We know that there's a light to our feet and a lamp to our path. We ask your blessings on each and every individual here in this building today. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. What the donkey knew. Um, <clears throat> I want to start off by giving you a little uh, background on donkeys in particular, animals in general. And then I want to look at this scripture That'll be the second thing I do, and then I want to um, preach to you on this idea, concept, what the donkey knew. Now, you know, I've used animals for illustrations a lot, and one of the things that I pointed out to you is that God has created people, and people are unique, and people are different. There are 9,000 species of birds. There are, you know, thousands of species of frogs, and of snakes, etc. And species, as a general rule, I've mentioned this lately, species as a general rule can never mate with some animal of another species. The rare exception is when two animals that are different species are pretty closely related. In other words, a donkey and a horse, or a donkey and a zebra, horse and a zebra. They're all 
pretty closely related. But however, if you crossbreed a horse with a, with, a, with a zebra, the animal that is created is sterile. It cannot reproduce. If you cross a horse with a donkey, you likewise create a mule, and, and it's sterile, and it cannot reproduce. So those are the rarities, and they only happen whenever two uh, species are very closely related. So usually when that happens, it's because humans have done it. Humans are the one that, you know, throw the animals in, in a together situation. So on the rare occasions where you see that, like, like the mule, the mule is not just horses out there fine and donkeys, it's human people putting them in confined spaces and, and creating this situation because people mess with stuff. So <clears throat> donkeys are similar to horses, but they're much different in many other ways. Some ways they're alike and some ways they're different. And, um, and so I want to mention this to you, and of course I've, I've given this illustration before. Let's pretend like this wall over here is dogs, and this wall over here is, is cats. And um, Sister Janet's not here today, she's a cat person, otherwise I'd make that the cat wall. But anyway, um, dogs are very friendly. Dogs are loyal to their masters, sometimes to an absurd degree. I actually knew somebody down at Martin, Brother, Brother Price, who had a, a couple of dogs. Um, one of them bit a, a little girl walking down the road. And so he, he shot his two dogs. And, and here these dogs were grown. He had them for many years. They were very close to him. He was very loyal to him. And he got his gun and went out and shot one of them. And the other one was, one was wounded, one died. The wounded one ran underneath the truck. And he called his dog out from under the truck. And the wounded dog that he just shot came out to him, and he shot and killed him again. Now, that is to totally mind-boggling to us as people. But the dog didn't understand the dog's love for his master and the overriding sense of whatever that he had overrode any instinct of realization of this is really stupid to come out, this guy just shot you and you're in pain. Why would you respond? That's because that's the way dogs are. I think in that regard, there's not an animal on earth that's been domesticated that is closer in connection to humans than a dog, because we all know that Cats just kind of tolerate your existence. <laughs> cats, are, you know, they're over there. The dogs, over there. cats, are over there. Horses are like dogs, not to the extreme. Nothing to the extreme. The horse. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna. There's dogs there. I'm gonna put the horses, you know, right over here. Horses can be extremely loyal to people, and donkeys. The donkeys are not like the cats, but they're kind of, you know, like somewhere in here. They're kind of, the horses are between the dogs and the donkeys. A horse can become very affectionate and very close to its master. The donkey, not so much. It can, but it takes a long time. It takes a, a good relationship. But here's what I have known for a long time. This is the difference between a donkey and a horse. A horse will let you kill it. A donkey won't. And when I say that, here's what I mean. A horse will let you ride him to death. A donkey won't. A horse will let you push him to the point of exhaustion until he collapses and dies. A donkey will not. Because a horse that is closely connected with his master will have that bond, not as good as a dog, but pretty good. And, and when you're pushing that horse, and that horse is in a place of exhaustion, and you keep pushing it, the horse will push on when it has no more ability and literally collapse and die because the horse will let the master ride him to death. The donkey won't. A donkey will stop and say, I, I, I can't go any further. You can't. Sorry. 
Doesn't matter how much you beat me. The story of Balaam exemplifies this. If Balaam had been riding a horse, then either from the love and relationship or the beating that he gave the horse, the horse would have trudged on into danger where there was a big angel with a big, you know, sword, but not a donkey. So here's the reason why this is. First, that's what I told you. Second, I just learned this on the internet a few days ago. Donkeys have a greater sense of fear than a horse, and a donkey is more careful than a horse. And so what happened with the donkey and Balaam is the donkey saw the angel the man did not see, and the donkey stopped. And the donkey, with his sense of danger, said, I am not going any further. And it doesn't matter how much you beat me. It doesn't matter what you do. This is as far as I'm going. Just beat me right here, but I, I'm not going over there. Okay. And the New Testament says, the donkey forbade the madness of the prophet <clears throat> and didn't go. And you know the story. So, you know, here's the thing. I believe the word of God. I believe the donkey talked. I don't think it was a donkey talking. I think it was God speaking to the donkey. So I believe that what was happening was that that donkey was being beaten by that prophet who was against the will of God. And in the process, that donkey's being beaten and God had mercy on the donkey. And God spoke through the donkey and the prophet was so out of control, he was so stupid, he didn't realize I got an animal talking to me. It never dawned on him. Wait a minute, I'm having a conversation with a donkey. Oh. And so that donkey forbade the madness of the prophet because the donkey knew something that the prophet did not know. The donkey knew there's somebody big in the road, there's somebody there. There's a, this is as far as I'm going to go. I'm not letting you beat all you want. That dude's bigger than you are, and I don't want to go where he is. I don't care what you beat me. Sometimes animals and their instinct realize things that people do not realize. There are some people that animals just meet for the first time, and they do not like them. And there are some people that... The animal meets them and automatically they just go warm up to them. When I was living in Hainesville, I was great friends with a, a couple there in the church, and they had a daughter who lived in the state of Maine. And she had a Doberman Pinscher. And she would come from Maine to Louisiana to visit her parents. And leave her husband you know, up there. He'd stay in Maine. She'd drive all the way here from Maine all the way to Louisiana, just her and the Doberman Pinscher. Nobody bothered her. And um, her Doberman Pinscher was, was highly trained. And she lived in a very rural area in Maine. And in that rural area, way out in the country, in the sticks, and way, the, some repairman came one day to, to do something. And her dog had a tremendous sensitivity to the master. And, and so, um, highly trained, well-trained dog. The, the repairman comes in, does what he does, does not even know there is a Doberman in the house. Because even though the Doberman is in the house and the Doberman knows the man's there, Doberman's so well trained, he's no big deal. He didn't even show up. He didn't, even show, he didn't even walk out there. And she, wasn't, she didn't tell him about the Doberman. She wouldn't wear that Doberman because the Doberman was highly trained and it wouldn't just go automatically bothering people, you know. But the Doberman knew the man was there. The man just didn't know the Doberman was there. And so he got finished doing what he's doing, and he left. <clears throat> Wasn't gone very long. He came back. When he came back, knocked on the door with some little excuse, and came back in the house, all of a sudden, she had this tremendous sense of fear of this man that had just come back to her house for no real reason. 
She was alone. Her husband was at work. She was out in the country in a rural area on a long driveway at the end of a, uh, you know, a road, a little country road. And when he came in there and had, she had this fear as he made an advancement toward her, the dog, the doberman in the other room, sensed the fear that the master had. And out of nowhere, this dog comes flying down the hallway and leaps and attacks the man. Of course, she called them the dog off, the man leaves, and then the man tried to press charges and sue and all that kind of stuff. And when they went to court, she told them what, she said, this is what I want you to do. They brought the doberman into the courthouse. The, the man wasn't in there. The doberman went around, wagged his tail. No, 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 no problems to anybody, you know. People petted him just like a big puppy, you know. No big deal. Big old doberman, but he, <laughs> but he just friendly to everybody in the building. No, no, no problem, you know. And, and she, she wanted to demonstrate doberman had no problems with any single person in that courtroom. Just playful acting like he was a, you know, a golden retriever or something. <clears throat> and then they brought the man out. <laughs> of course, she was holding the Doberman at that point. <laughs> Before she just let him go in the courtroom, you know. She had to, and as soon as that Doberman saw that man, <laughs> his whole entire dispos <laughs> disposition had changed, and he's chomping the bits. <laughs> Judge says... Case dismissed. <laughs> oh. See, God made animals a certain way. Out there where I live, I got snakes, I got lizards, I got salamanders and frogs. And when I say I got them, you know, they're out there in the field. And, you know, <clears throat> very rarely see a snake. I killed a frog the other day, not intentionally. I would never kill a frog intentionally, but I had, this, I had some weeds there. I was pulling, you know, if you stick your hand into some weeds, you know, it could be dangerous. <laughs> but I, I, I got something there. I was going to whack out some stuff before I started. And when I whacked it out, I, there was a frog in there, and he got whacked, and he was gone. Last year, I, 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 I killed a, um, a snake with a weed eater. Again, non-intentional. But he was in a little swampy area, and I was weeding some of those places I got to get to. So I had weeders in there, whack, 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 you know, when, when all the stuff, there's a snake there, just kind of on his last breath. <laughs> we either got him before I knew he was, you know, there. I very rarely see, now here's the difference in behavior, and I, I mentioned this before you about salamanders. Salamanders are the, are the, the most spooky, they're, they're spooked easily, though, Jeremy. And they're nervous. They're noisy. They're, they're in, they're in, you know, they, salamander looks like a snake with legs. They're slimy, got that fat, plump body like a snake. So, you know, you can, it's easy to tell a lizard from a salamander. That, that shape the salamander's a little bigger. But the difference is a lizard's, you know, skinnier. Salamander's just plump. Salamander, again, looks like, a, you know, a little short snake with legs on it. But the salamander... And the snake are completely opposite in their, their way they act. The salamander is the most skittish animal there is. So if I'm out doing something and all of a sudden I can tell some animal's right there and it's just going crazy on the salamander before I even look now. Because I mean, it's going nuts. Oh no, oh, danger! Crash into the stuff and I'm like, okay, salamander. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not gonna buy A lot of times I see I go, salamander! You know, they, they're all crashing and running trying into a dead end, you know. That one the other day ran into a cinder block. And he's, where'd it go? You'll be all right, buddy. That's the way a salamander acts. A lizard is not disturbed. A lizard doesn't run. A lizard will stand right there and do push-ups for you. They're not spooked. They're not disturbed. They're not irritated. They see you, and they don't go anywhere. Whatever. Now, a salamander is an amphibian. A lizard is a, is a reptile. A snake's a reptile. But you know what the snakes do? 
usually you don't know they're there. You know the salamander's there. They can't help it. Oh, no. Invasion. You know the lizard's there because he didn't run. He's just still there. Hanging out where he was. He didn't budge. He didn't go anywhere. I'm right here. But the snake is never out in the open. The snake is stealth. The snake hides. The snake doesn't panic. But the snake's not going to be in the open. So every time I see a snake, I know there's a hundred of them I didn't see. They behave a certain way because God put within them the programming of how to behave. God made them to behave a certain way. Very quickly, I want to cover this issue here in 21. I want to point something out to you in the Greek. Let's go back to the 21st chapter because if you read this passage of Scripture in Mark and Luke, it only mentions the cult. It does not mention the mama. It just mentions the cult in Matthew, or excuse me, in Mark and Luke. But in Matthew, when the Scripture says that, that God, or the Lord sent these men to get this donkey, it says this, Verse 2, the Lord says, you're going to go to a village, you're going to find a donkey tied and a colt with her, loose them and bring them unto me, verse 2. Now, I want to point a couple things out to you in the Greek, and um, let me give you this little tidbit of information. A horse that is a male is called a stallion, a horse that is a female is called a mare, a donkey that's a male is called a jack. A female is called a Jenny. But a baby male horse is called a colt, and a baby male donkey is called a colt. A foal means it's a, it's a baby. It's not just a colt. It's a colt that's maybe, you know, a, just a year old. Foal is what you're, when, when they're born, whether it's male or female, it is born a foal. The foal is the offspring. The foal is that, that term you used the first year. So we have here a donkey, the colt I'm talking about, which is a male that's probably just maybe a year old. It has never been ridden. Never been ridden. But Jesus rode him. So in this passage of Scripture... In, the, um, in your Bible, if you're looking at your Bible in King James, I want to point out something in verse 2. It says this. You notice the word them and the cult with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. The word them in your King James is in italics, which means that the word them is not actually in the Greek. You're going to find the donkey, the cult with her, loose and bring to me is basically, in essence, what it says. But they put the word them in there just to kind of clarify. And then the Scripture says, They did what Jesus commanded, and they brought the donkey and the colt. Verse 7, And put on them their clothes, and they set him thereupon. And you notice again in verse 7, the word him is not in the passage. They sat on him. Now, in King James, in English, it sounds like Jesus is riding a donkey and a bomb at the same time. He was not riding two different animals. He rode the colt. In fact, the matter is, in Mark and Luke, it does not even mention the mama. It just mentions the baby, the colt. Preaching to you on what the donkey knew. The King James Version, or excuse me, the, the writer Mark and the writer Luke only mention the colt. Now, this is a... A common thing in, 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 in the theme of the New Testament, there's places where you see, as Scripture says, Jesus healed two blind men. And then when you read over in Mark, the same story, it says that blind Bartimaeus, I didn't even mention the other guy. So was there only one guy? No, there was two. It's just that what happens is that it's common oftentimes in Jewish custom to tell a story and just mention the main primary individual and not mention the other ones. So the main primary individual in this story is the colt. The mama's there. 
But the mama's not the, the main subject here. It is this cult that Jesus is riding upon. The second thing you need to understand is the most common word in the New Testament in the Greek is the word chi. Chi. <clears throat> and chi usually is translated and. And. Most of the time it's translated and. And basically chi has like eight different ways you can translate it. The number one way is and. So we look at verse 5. Behold, the king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon a donkey, and a colt, the foal of a donkey. Put that there. Okay, there it is. And by the way, the word donkey did not exist 400 years ago when the King James was translated. The word donkey came into usage because this word 400 years ago became a cuss word. And so King James couldn't use the word donkey because the word donkey didn't exist yet. So when that verse says, well, that verse says right there, tell the daughter of Zion, behold, the king cometh upon unto thee meek and sitting upon a donkey and a colt, the foal of a donkey. It sounds like it's saying he's, he's on, sitting on two animals. So the word chi can be translated and. The word chi can be translated but. The word chi can be translated then. The word chi can be translated both. The word chi can be translated and then. The word chi can be translated namely. And the word chi can be translated even. And when it's translated even, it's because there's emphasis. So this verse of scripture, put it up, 25.15 in the Holman translation. Matthew 2.15 in the Holman translation. This word chi can be translated even. It's a way of emphasis. So in other words, the way I would have translated it is just like Holman translated it. Manner on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Because, by the way, that particular word that's used there at the end of the verse is not the normal word donkey. It is a word that literally in the Greek just means any beast of burden. And so the emphasis is he's, Jesus riding on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The emphasis of the scripture is that Jesus is on this donkey. Emphasis, it is a colt. It is the offspring of a beast of burden. And so what Matthew is wanting you to understand is that Jesus Christ is riding on the offspring of a beast of burden. He's not coming in a Cadillac. He's not riding a Rolls Royce. He's not in a Mercedes Benz. He just rolled up here in an AMC Pace. Got to be a certain age to get that one, Brother Price. <laughs> it's a pinto. That'd be a better illustration. I should have thought of that first. He's in a pinto. Whoa. This is not high dollar wheels we got here. He's on a donkey. Even a, a colt, the offspring of a beast of burden. He's not the offspring of royalty. He's not coming on the It's not the offspring of grandeur. It's not the offspring of wealth. 97%, I believe, 96, 97% of the, of the donkeys in the world are in poor countries used by poor people. I learned that from Wikipedia two days ago. <laughs> if Wikipedia is correct. Because even today, the donkey is not owned by the rich man. The donkey is not to possess. The, the, the rich man has got a $28,000 horn. I used to have a Frisian down the street from me. Oh, there were only five Frisians in the state of Louisiana at the time, and three of them were on my road owned by the same people, and they had a Frisian horse. That's a horse. 20, not as big as a Clydesdale, but in the neighborhood. $28,000 they paid to buy the Frisian, put it on a ship from Europe, and bring it to the United States of America so they could have a Frisian. Hey, Fred, what have you got more money 
and they got them on. <laughs> By the way, that's, that's the reason why I got Secretary's grant. You know, they're the folks that sold that to me because they were bored of the thoroughbreds and I sold that to Jordan because they love Jordan. And then when you know, we're going to do Frisians now. Ladies and gentlemen, there are horses that are a million bucks. But there ain't no expensive donkey. You can buy dogs for 500, for 1,000, or 50. You can get a cat for free right now. All the cats you want. You're not going to pay. You don't have to take out a loan to buy a donkey. He didn't come on an Arabian. He didn't ride into town on a thoroughbred. I got news for you. The Bible says, Brother Bernie, when he comes back the next time, he's going to be on that white horse. When he comes back the next time, he's going to be on the white horse. But the first time he rode into Jerusalem on the donkey, the next time he's coming on the white horse because he is coming in power and in glory. But the first time he came humbly on a donkey, the product of a beast of birth because he came robed in humility he came the first time in poverty he left the riches of heaven and he came in poverty I'm preaching to you on the subject of what the donkey knew so here's something else I learned on the internet a few days ago donkeys have longer pregnancies than horses. And donkeys take care of their babies a longer period of time than horses. And when people own donkeys and horses, when the mama weans her little colt, the mama horse, and kind of kicks it away, oftentimes if that, that little colt horse has been around where they also have a, a, a mama donkey, a female donkey, the, little, the donkey will adopt the horse. And the horse, the little colt, whose mama says, grow up, boy. He says, I'm not ready to grow up. And he will turn to the donkey for affection. And the donkey will take him in and take care of him. And so when Matthew says, go get the colt, bring the mama. The colt knew mama's here. But the colt did something against any instinct that he had because I watched a video a couple days ago on how to train a donkey to ride him and the man says it's slow process because they're skittish and they're scared and they're nervous and you gotta build relationship with them and you gotta get close to them and put the saddle on them and Pet them and be kind to them, and then, and then you know, maybe just put your foot in, in the stirrup, and, and you know, eventually get up there and sit a little while and get back down. And then, over the course of time, when you build this, eventually, you know, you, you establish a relationship. He said, It takes a while for the donkey to warm up to you, much slower process than the horse. What the scripture is telling us is the miraculous happened. It was two different lessons. The lesson to the people who were saying Hosanna, they were recognizing Jesus who rode into town on the Pinto, clothed in humility, clothed in poverty. That was their lesson. The lesson to the apostles was, I'm going to show you another miracle. This donkey's coming, and this donkey's going to let you. 
I'm preaching to you on what the donkey knew. What the donkey knew, there was something inside that little colt, that one-year-old baby, that sensed something in Jesus that was different than anything he'd ever felt in the presence of any other person. What the donkey knew was this is not an ordinary man. What the donkey knew is mama's here and mama's calm. Mama's not upset. Mama's not overprotective like mama normally is because what the mama knew, what the donkey's mama knew was something's different about this man. He is no ordinary man. He's no ordinary man. There's something different. And with ease and no trouble, as they put their stuff on those that mama to carry the packs, and the saddle or whatever they use on the donkey, and then Jesus got on the donkey with ease. What the donkey knew was this is not an ordinary situation. This is not an ordinary thing. There's something extraordinary about what is happening today. And with the calmness of a mother right there, and the calmness that that donkey felt from both Jesus and his mother, Christ came riding with a crowd yelling Hosanna, with the crowd waving branches, behavior that would normally be disturbing and upsetting to an animal of this nature that did not really grasp what was going on with all the excitement that's going on, everything around. It was still a calm ride into Jerusalem because whether or not the donkey could comprehend the magnitude of what was taking place, God had chosen this donkey and sent a message to the world that here comes your savior, here comes your king, he's riding humbly, he's coming on the donkey, he's coming against impossible odds, he's coming against insane stuff. This is not normal, this is not ordinary, this is not the ordinary thing, it is not the ordinary situation, but I have sent my savior on the, the offspring of a beast of birth. In life, people want grandeur. Human nature, greatness, and grandeur. But God resists the proud, and God giveth grace unto the humble. Musicians, would you come? Brother Clayville, we had a man that went to our church. He's passed away. My son Jonathan used to joke and say he, he would call him a CIA agent, CIA guy. He was 18 years old, and he joined the military. And he spent 20 years in the military, and he rose from private to major. And after 20 years, and, 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 and by the way, for those of you who don't know this, Brother Ray can tell you this, you know, you got officers and you got enlisted men, right? Brother Mike, you got officers. And, right. So, so the enlisted guys go in there 18 years old, private. Officers don't start at 18. Officers, they go off to West Point, and Air Force Academy. They go off to the Naval Academy, and they come out. And when they graduate, they're officers. And they go to the military, and the sergeants have to tell them what to do. I mean, they're in charge, but the sergeant you know, knows what's going on, and they don't yet. <laughs> Allison was 18 years old. He went to college while he was an enlisted man, working his way up. Corporal, sergeant, whatever. Got a college degree, went into officer training school, and transitioned from the 18-year-old enlisted man who was a private to becoming an officer 
and ended his 20-year career as a major. And then, at the age of 38, he joined the National, NSA, National Security Administration, and he worked 20 years in national security. I never asked him what he did, but when he wrote a check to the church, it was from Langley Federal Credit Union. Therefore, my son Jonathan would say, CIA agent. And at 58, he retired, second retirement. Born and raised Catholic. 58 years old, he moved to South Carolina, became hungry for God, started to think in terms of, of what to do and searching for God. And, and he was well off, had been successful in life. He found a little Pentecostal church with 30 people in South Carolina. And he started going there, 59, 60 years old. Went there a short while and moved to Shreveport. And when he came here, he just showed up. Found us in the phone book or whatever. I don't know if internet was up running then. He shows up here and comes in. Never said much. As quiet as can be. The only reason why I ever knew he was in the military is because the check said Major Michael Allison, U.S. military, retired. Blankly Federal Credit Union. If it hadn't been for that, quiet, non-assuming work day, he'd be out here, be at a work day back there just chopping down stuff and burning stuff and 60-some-year-old man just working along with everybody else. Taught him a Bible study. I baptized him in Jesus' name. He ended up moving back to Florida and he passed away a short while after that, staying in communication. One day I tried to call him and his wife answered the phone and said, he, he's gone. The reason why I use him for an illustration is because from the way he conducted himself and the way he acted, people would have just thought he was just a, somebody that didn't have anything, even though he had accomplished quite a bit and was quite successful financially and you never would have realized anything because he just seemed like just some guy that if, if he'd have... If you'd have found out he's in the military and you'd asked me, he said, yeah, I was in the military. He really didn't volunteer much information. This is the reason why that he would go to a church by the, by the wheel of 30 people in South Carolina. Because God resists the proud and God gives grace to the humble. You won't make it to heaven. You're going to make it to heaven because you got humility. You're going to make it to heaven because you, you got a sense of realization of some stuff. You see, I could have preached a sermon and, you know, the book of Ken, I could have said, well, you know, the donkey, he's just like, I'm taking the king into Jerusalem. But the donkey didn't know that. The donkey didn't realize. He didn't realize the magnitude. The mama donkey didn't realize the magnitude of what was happening that Jesus Christ, God robed in flesh, was riding into Jerusalem. The donkey did not understand and comprehend the significance of what he was doing. All the donkey knew was, I feel good about this man. And mama's calm. Mama feels good too. And in his limited Donkey brain. He didn't even know. Uh, you know. 
horses. Everybody loves them, not just a donkey. Sister Rogers, our problem is we overthink. We overthink. Why didn't they choose me? I'm great. What do you mean, that river? We got better rivers in my city. Why can't I dump in my dump Jacob? Jump in my river. My river is wonderful. Why do I go down there and stink you dirty river? That's the spirit that God will never be attracted to. Sometimes in life, if you just understand and humble yourselves and say, God, what can I do for you? How can I serve you? Sister Jenny, we may never comprehend the importance of stuff we do for the kingdom of God. We may, may never grasp and understand the significance of what we do for the kingdom of God. We never know. We may never realize. We had a man in this church, you probably heard me brag and talk about him in the back of the past. This guy named Al Braggs, he was 37 years old when he died. And usually when I talk about this guy, I talk about what a great guy he was. But says Diane, he came to our church because Mary West came around in a hospital room and went in there and did what she did and talked to everybody about Jesus. Prayed a little prayer for him. Told Brother Keith Adcock about him and Keith went up there to the hospital and taught him home Bible study. And Al Brands came and was baptized in Jesus' name. And this, this, this man's sister played a little I've preached to hundred some funerals and I've been to two hundred more beyond that. And you can you know this to be true. Doctors and nurses don't show up for funerals of people they tend to because I mean they just can't. When I preached this man's funeral, doctors and nurses came. He'd been hospitalized numerous occasions, and the building was filled. In fact, last year of his life, there was a nurse that volunteered to bring him because he needed a nurse's care to even come to church. He wanted to come to church. The nurse brought him. My own personal physician, I, I saw him one day, and he was in there. I went up to see Al, and he's in the hospital now. He's in there with Al. And I said, oh, you know, happened to have the same, same personal physician. And he turned to me and said, I said, oh, he said, Al goes to your church. I said, yeah, Al goes to church. He said, I always come see Al first. Everybody else in this hospital is depressed. When I come in this hospital, I'm going to go see Al Braggs first, take care of him, and then see everybody else. God wants us to understand that real greatness is not because we end our lives with a massive whatever account. Pack the building out with people that come to our funeral. Well, that's great. That's great that it happens. And the reason why some people pack the building out is because they've, they've touched a lot of lives. But there's some folks that touch lives and people do not even realize the magnitude. And we're talking about Mary West. People do not even realize the impact that they make. Because to Mary West, it didn't matter who you were. It didn't matter what your situation was. God had the answer. God could heal you. God could transform you. What can I do for Jesus? And sometimes in life, we really do not know the significance of what we're doing. And in this regard, what the donkey didn't know is who was riding on his back. What the donkey didn't know is the significance of the events of that day. All the donkey knew is I feel good about this man and mama's okay. Sometimes when you step out in faith, you step out in faith because you put your total trust in God.
and you don't understand all the parameters. You don't recognize all the parameters. But you still make the step in faith. Let's magnify the Lord and thank Him for this earth. Father, you're so gracious and so marvelous and so mighty and so wonderful. We thank you, we praise you, we magnify you for all that you've done for us. He's a blessed redeemer. 